Knock, knock. Who's there? Some guy fucking some girl who's not his wife. Some guy who's fucking some girl who's not his wife. Who? Non-monogamy, which is what we're talking about. That's dreadful. That is just... (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Hi, friends. We're talking about non-monogamy. And polyamory. Today, you're going to hear Beth talking with John her boyfriend, about John's wedding to Kat, his wife. And so we're mentioning non-monogamy because we want to be perfectly clear that Kat, John, and Beth are all good friends who all communicate the details of their relationship to one another and are engaging in these relationships with full knowledge, consent, love, and warmth. But we broach this subject because polyamory, ethical non-monogamy, monogamiciousness is a fairly common feature of Burning Man relationships. Turns out when you get a bunch of artists and bohemians and uh, crafts people together for weeks or potentially months on end out in the desert, some things can happen. Going forward in this podcast, we imagine you're going to be hearing quite a lot of stories with non-monogamous themes. So if you're uncomfortable with this, well, you know, the sexual revolution is a half century old, so uh, get with it, kids. When our stories drift towards Naganamu. <laughs> so when our stories drift, like one's when, penis to the left, right, downward, or upward. When we begin to mumble about multiple partners. <laughs> You're welcome, Beth. <laughs> this Ed, this, I challenge this you this to edit that into something cohesive. <laughs> you know what I think I would like? <laughs> I'd like you to listen to the stuff we did about polyamory. Maybe you ought to do it with us. Ah, Yes. So counterpoint, (laughs) I hate listening to myself talk about polyamory because I feel like I sound like such an asshole. Like it's just my my viewpoints are really irritating. Apologize first, accuracy third. Great, I love what you guys say. I don't think I need to be involved. Like I am, (laughs) I'm fine. Okay. I will save my rant for how creepy monogamy is for our, like, episode that is just all of us sounding like assholes. (laughs) So, guys, meet John. Hi, John. Hi, guys. Hi, John. It's nice to meet you. It's nice for you to be here. And, John, I'm going to interview you now, and it's going to be kind of awkward. Like, we haven't been dating for five and a half years. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But you're married. I am. You're married to Kat. I've been married for 12 years, long enough that I have to think about it and do the math. Let's say 12 years. We met on an internet date where she thought she was posting a personal ad on the website of Secretary the Movie. So she was looking for a very kinky person. And I was posting an advert on a very kind of like right-wing Seattle local website. Because I just moved (laughs) there and I didn't know my left from my right. (laughs) Were were you still confused by which side of the road people were driving on? Oh my god, yes. (laughs) Oh my god, yes. Um, So we had a kind of an awkward and weird first date that we both walked away from thinking, well, never mind, but we might hang out and have some fun again. (laughs) The the wedding. The budget was $70. Um, Most of that went on a cake that we got from the Safeway across the street that they spelt my name wrong on. So Kat had to do some surgery on the cake to fix my name. That's fantastic. It it's was... easier to take an H away than to add an H. Right, right, <laughs> right. You just had to take the top off the H and then remove the final N and turn that H into an N. Boom, mm. John. All of a sudden, it's not a spelling yeah. problem. It's a kerning problem. Yeah. It, was, it was slightly a marriage of convenience in that I was about to be ejected from this country when my work visa expired. And it was an awful lot easier for her to come with me back to England than it was for me to stay with her in in America. I have a friend who was very dear to me as a teenager who went to Burning Man when he was 18 and had an experience which he couldn't not share with everybody for a long time. And this had... If he went when he was 18 and he's your contemporary, this would have been the early to mid 90s? Um, yeah, like 95, 96, 97, mm-hmm. somewhere, somewhere in there. And um, he was in America when he found out about it or he was in uh, England? No, he traveled from England to go there. He was a lot cooler than me when I was a teenager. You would have had to have been to know about Burning Man in the mid 90s in England yeah, as an 18 yeah. year old. And maybe he might have been 20, but he was certainly like 
a young man mm-hmm. finding f- finding himself, and that was part of his process of finding himself for real. Bless him, and I have love in my heart for him, but he is an insufferable git. <laughs> um, Burning Man gave him a topic to be insufferable about. Oh, I said it's done for so many of us. So that was that was actually my first exposure to Burning Man until I moved to Seattle and hooked up with a crowd of burners, hippies, perverts, slash, etc. Our people. Pervies. Yeah. yeah. I've been to small druggy campouts. What specifically kind of small druggy campouts have you been to before? This is airing some dirty laundry. <laughs> <laughs> I was a teenage juggler. Um, I went to juggling conventions. I pitched my tent around parking lots and spent my days drunkenly throwing things at other morons. Um, <laughs> and it was beautiful and I regret none of it. That, that sounds like a... a a, a 70s teen-oriented warning story. Yeah. I was a teenage juggler. Like that, but it's England, so with more tea. <laughs> <laughs> so a teenage juggler? Oh. oh I, uh, Beth, please edit that out. Yeah, no, I'm not even awful. justifying that. <laughs> I'm, I'm mostly offended that I didn't think of that first <laughs> and decide not to say it. Imagine Burning Man with 120 people and it's in a parking lot. There was one food truck stroke tent where you could buy all of the vegan weirdness you wanted Mm. um it was around a theater so there was like there were shows professionals would come into town there were shows in the evenings and the theater had an awful cafeteria so it's like this weird like mix of hippie festival culture and provincial theater it's a very family friendly thing like especially during the day it's open to the public and it's it's very much a draw, like come in, come to workshops, let's all teach your kids to juggle and they'll have a great time, you'll have a great time, you'll buy a ticket for the show and come see you. Like genuinely world-class professionals do mind-boggling things on stage in front of you mm-hmm. and go home and then all the people who have come here for the weekend will get drunk in the car park after you've gone home. As a as a 16-year-old, I set my hair on fire doing fire poi. You know, that was kind of a rite of passage, right? Your hair or your dreadlocks? It has been many years since dreadlocks were even a possibility for me. <laughs> <laughs> it is a little community, and there's definitely like an analog to Burning Man or to any kind of just annual event where you get the same amorphous, constantly shifting group together on an annual basis. You know, it's a much smaller scale of that. I have friends that that I'm still vaguely in contact, you know, kind of Facebook contact with today that I haven't seen since I was 20. If this August I was to go back to that festival, nothing would have changed. We'd get on like a house on fire. We'd all be different, but it would still be the same people doing the same stupid shit. Are you as proficient as you used to be at juggling? God, no. So that would have changed. Well, that <laughs> that happens with age. <laughs> well, it's because they're used to heavier pins back in the day. The pins were, <laughs> they were more dense. They were carved out of hardwood. Needed, when I was your age, I had to juggle uphill both ways. You needed to know a guy with a lathe. So he could spin <laughs> juggling pins for you. Or you just have to get the old cast-offs from the bowling alley. And you never knew what the weight of those were. Uh, we did take ferrets to a juggling festival, and they might have been the most popular people there. Ferrets um, are pretty awesome. Yeah. They do tend to dominate a party. Yeah. I will say I didn't drop a single ferret. <laughs> <laughs> now, do they ball up when you toss them? They weren't super pleased about it. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't last long. <laughs> Did they bite you when you juggled them? Uh, no, but w- we had an understanding. You know, we had we had practiced before the show. You know, I didn't just walk out on stage with cold ferrets. <laughs> <laughs> Did you by any chance sedate these ferrets before walking out on stage? Uh, yes, we actually yes. So you know what catnip is? Mm-hmm. Yes. There's a ferret version of that. And it comes in an oil, and you can put it either on the ferret itself, and then it will just go nuts eating itself out. Or you can put it on, <laughs> like... Maybe find different words. <laughs> no, For those of you those out there who <laughs> aren't Anglophiles, you might not know what themselves <laughs> out Go means. ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go on. If we potentially did sedate them with some oil to keep them interested in themselves, rather than the crowd of drunken idiots hooting at them. Uh, My wife and I moved back to the States and we had a few friends and those friends had made some new friends. And some of those friends were Burners and one of those friends was Beth. And we moved back in about March or April. Mm -hmm. 
So, of course, these new friends that we just got back in contact with were like, hey, it's really good to see you guys in like four months. <laughs> and we're going to be super busy and talk about nothing else but this thing that doesn't interest you. Our friends were all just absent for four months. Mm -hmm. We're just like, well, fuck you guys. Well, <laughs> you know. And the second you were like, well, you know, after you've heard the stories and you're like, yeah, I'm bored, but it sounds fun. Um, and then eventually you start to come around like, like, maybe I should come do this thing with you. Yeah, so we'd been married for, do the math, do the math, seven years at that point. Um, eight years, maybe? Seven and a half years. We've moved around a lot while we're together, but haven't taken a lot of vacations together. Like, it's not that we're not self-indulgent, we're very self-indulgent, but... But you haven't celebrated your relationship. Yeah, 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 it's been kind of implicit. And we were kind of looking for a way to do something significant at Burning Man. So I'll give you a caveat first. Beth asked me about this about a week ago. And the next day I'm sitting at work thinking, shit, man, I've drunk a lot of beer since then. <laughs> I, don't, I don't necessarily remember the fine details, but thankfully my wife Kat does. Um, so, so I went home that night and we sat down to have dinner and I said, hey, why don't you tell me the story of us renewing our vows um, to prod my memory. Um, and she did. And hopefully I'm not just going to repeat verbatim what she said, but we'd very carefully left our wedding rings at home in a safe place because you don't take anything out to the plier that you're going to be sad that doesn't come back with you. Mm -hmm. well, it's wise for a first timer. Well trained. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. This is what happens when, when you've been around burners for four years before you go to the burn. Uh -huh. You know, you pick up some habits. I just bring more than one wedding ring out. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I travel with no fewer than five wedding rings out to the playa. We went to Goodwill and, and spent perhaps $8 each on playa wedding rings to find a day in that they made both of our fingers green and itchy. <laughs> so... So, you know, we didn't wear them the whole time, but we took them with us when we were renewing our vows for ceremonial purposes. Um, and we didn't really have a plan in mind. We just went wandering because who knows what you're going to find, right? There's sideshows, there's things to see, there's mm -hmm. art to go and look at and climb on and jump off. And one of the things that we found was a clock tower, I think, with a hamster wheel inside of it, like a human-sized hamster oh, wheel. Oh, I smashed my face real good on that hamster wheel. Right? Yeah. Why wouldn't you? It's got a lot of momentum when Doesn't you try and just, stop. Isn't it brilliant? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you want to run on it and do yourself a oh, mischief? Yeah. Carry on, and uh, we get to the temple. I look down at my hand and realize that there's no ring on it, and I turn to Kat and say, this might be a big deal. We might need to go and find my ring. Turn around and make maybe ten steps. When an art car pulls up, and there's a lady in it who's middle-aged-ish um, and dressed like the earth that is on the top of her earth car, like she has the matching dress. We must have had panic in our faces because she just looked at us and said, do you guys need a ride? Of course we said, yeah. You know, we're looking for this ring, but we don't really know where we lost. <laughs> it was one of the most charming and touching short experiences of a person I've ever had, right? Like... She had been in a, a, a terrible relationship for many years and had hit the final straw and said, well, fuck it, I'm done. Okay, I'm out of here. And she had walked out and gone to Burning Man. Like, what she owned was what was in her car right then. So she was kind of like trying to figure out how to end her relationship as Kat and I were were recognizing the different shape that ours was in compared to when we were married. So it was this short, brief, intense experience with this lady where, like, for about 10 minutes, all the three of us just, like, slowly drive across the playa crying at each other, <laughs> you know. And, you know, we, we stopped at a few places and looked around for the ring and got back to this hamster thing just as some other bunch of people were playing with this exhibit. As we're looking around, a few of them see us looking around and say, hey, what, what are you looking for? Like, you need help looking? So we had like 40-odd people in maybe a 100-foot radius slowly walking around with their heads <laughs> down, staring at the ground, just like, like I'm, I'm getting kind of bummed out by this. Mm -hmm. Like, this was, this was like a big deal that we were working on, and yeah, it kind of went pear-shaped. English for fucked up. Until one of these 
looked like a 16 year old kid just goes you know there's a door in the bottom of this thing and you can get underneath it and find all the shit that people lose when they're in it that's a really smart design choice right good job giant hamster wheel people yeah who, right? who has that much forethought at burning man right long time experienced burners you know there you go there was there was my fake pretend eight dollar walmart wedding ring our friend in the art car was over the moon this was some like redemption that relationships could work for her so she drove us all the way back to the temple weeping the whole way hugging us both like it's 11 o'clock in the morning um, the temple is heaving with people. We look at things and we take in the spectacle and kind of like you know, ab- absorb the ambiance. It's a, it's a weirdly powerful place, right? There's, there's a few hundred people being surprisingly quiet. So, you know, we turn to each other. Um, and when I asked Kat about this, she said, I don't remember anything of what we said to each other. I don't remember any of that. I remember before it and after it. I've only had a few experiences in my life that were like that. That was one of them. Um, another one was when I parachuted out of an airplane, like between jumping out of the airplane and looking up to see the parachute that tells me that I wasn't going to die. So <laughs> there, was, there was clearly some like heightened something going, going on there, but neither of us can remember it. But the next thing we both remember is like the, let's say, 15 people around us, because we're up on a balcony, you know, and it's just like the 15 people who are closest to us start clapping. In the temple. Oh, that's uh, oh, that's beautiful. usually well, reserved I... for crying for entirely different reasons. Oh, oh yeah, I had, a, I had a good crying visit to it the earlier in the week, like the day before or two. Yeah, yeah. That's I... what it's there for. <laughs> to go and cry yeah, at yeah, sure. the oh. temple where yeah. you can cry. Yeah. I only go first thing in the morning, so there's as small a crowd there as possible. And you can really move through there and uh, and look at all of the ways that people are are mourning the different people in their lives that that either have passed or haven't been able to go to Burning Man or or things about themselves or their own lives that they need to work through. And I can't be crowded with with so much of that. The twenty or thirty people that are there that five forty five in the morning when I decide to stop by sometime during the week, that's overwhelming enough let alone, like, a huge crush of people who, who are really having an emotional moment. God, that you've kind of got to cope with just from being around that much empathy and and that much discharge of emotion. Sure, or you can just avoid it, like I do. I did that for years. Yeah, it um, works well for but me. But the architecture of it has been beautiful it's the past couple of years. It's way too pretty to... Oh, no, I don't. I, like, bike around it and look at it from distances. I have feelings about it from distances, but, like, you get in too close, and then it's like, oh, no, I'm going to just start crying because there are about 20 people crying around here. That's okay. Sometimes it's okay to just start crying. Sometimes starting crying is like a functional part of being a person, you know? know. Just go to the temple, get it over with, and get out. (laughs) Um, This this year, um, a good friend of mine died this last year. And I actually ran into one of his best friends, like, happenstancely on the playa. Like, uh, we were playing a game of kickball, and we're randomly assigned to the same side. And uh, he was someone who, uh, like, they had played D&D together when they were kids, and we'd gone out raving together because we were cool teenagers. And um, then he... Did you wear your candy necklace? Oh, I... And your Jinko jeans? I didn't have Jinko jeans. Those are expensive. <laughs> did, did you call it going to a rave? Shut up. <laughs> um, we'd gone out and partied together, and then Jason drank himself to death at 33. Yeah. And I ran into his friend out there, and he was, let's go out to the temple together. Remember, Jason, you you do that. I brought a sweatshirt out there for him, and I basically biked past the temple, threw the sweatshirt at the temple, and ran away. <laughs> That was it. Like, my morning, I don't know how to do it in, in sort of that space. Um, I appreciate it. The first couple of years when I went there, I really appreciated it because I wasn't personally mourning anyone. I was just, like, walking around feeling lovely about the space that was provided. Uh, but once I got more fucked up and lost more people, I was like, ah, fuck. <laughs> All of a sudden, this is real. Yeah. I've kind of seen it as a emotional lubricant it's an easy access to catharsis 
perhaps for some of us that struggle to get there by ourselves. Yeah, like, says, I, and says I've, the guy I've seen cry like twice in our entire relationship. Like, is that a lot or is that not enough? That's... <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not sure what you're saying here. <laughs> well, it's nice to be able to just go somewhere where you know that that's completely appropriate, right? And you can engage in those feelings, deal with them, have them. And then walk out the other side of the temple, and there's some art to go distract you. I think it is the beating heart of the whole city. Mm -hmm. Personally, I just can't get too close to it. And it is very often the most beautiful thing out there. Uh, there have only been a few temples that, that haven't sucked. really blown me away. I wouldn't even say they suck. They're all pretty amazing. Some of them just haven't quite rung my bell the way they usually do. There was a the weird Martian sculpture garden. The chessboard? Yeah. That, that was, was my first temple. And I didn't get the temple. I certainly didn't understand the uh, the need to not spill beer all over uh, Beth's backpack. That is not the first nor the last beer that we'll get on that Correct. backpack. Correct. Could uh, you give me a, a beer while you're... There's a sopping <laughs> towel over there. Um, John, do you have a player name we should be calling you? No, I do not. Fabulous. John is pretty I innocuous. Am, I am slightly anti player names. Um, partly, I think, be I attribute that to my exposure to the BDSM community before I got to the playa community. That's one of the reasons I hate player names is because of the BDSM names. Yeah, the, the, like the more ridiculous version of that. BDSM names are the worst. Thank you, sir. They're pretty bad. I think that uh, Renfair nicknames are also pretty bad. Ooh, fair um, enough. I don't know many Renfair nicknames. When you're there, it's kind of enforced. Red and fair nicknames are enforced because you're period and like everybody is a thing. You're not period. You thing. don't have cholera. You're, you're pooping in a porta potty. No, you're not fucking. Period. There's cholera in that porta potty. Did when you you're forced to have name? a nickname like that, you're going to either choose a completely irresponsible nickname, or somebody is going to give you a nickname that you hate and grudgingly have people call you, <laughs> and that's uh, that's a terrible situation. That's why I like that you know some of our friends like their name is Beth and their playa name is Drunk Beth. Because Beth was drunk one night. And and boom, that's how you get your play name. You know, I went for four years before I got a play name that stuck. And boy, <laughs> howdy, drunk Beth stuck. Well, I mean, drunk Beth, I haven't gotten a play name at all. <laughs> Really? Yeah, never. Has Rex. Rex isn't um, a play name. Rex is a radio handle because my real name is inaudible on the radio. Wrong. And in case my listeners are wondering, my real name is Wall. <laughs> <laughs> you just the the sound of a whale call. It, it really is. <laughs> it's so bad when I answered the phone for a living. My answered my phone is Sven. Sven. <laughs> Nobody n misunderstands you when you say your name is Sven. I thought I was rare being three years in, and well, it was also I resist them because I don't like any of them. And fuck you if you call me something I don't like. Drunk breath. I I don't. This is as warm as I've ever felt about a playa name. <laughs> I originally went to Burning Man and tried to get people to call me Beatbox. <laughs> <laughs> Not because I can Beatbox. You know, I'm going to be honest, part of my residence about player names in general is because a dear friend of mine who shall remain nameless picked his own player name, and I just felt that was in poor taste. Oh, it is. It's yeah, it terrible. is. I, I've um, felt really uncomfortable on uh, having to pick my radio handle, and, and that's not just something I did for convenience. There is really regulations about what you call yourself on the radio. Rex and D-Day both refer to this as the radio because they're old. This isn't the radio, this is a podcast, but when, when Rex is talking right now, he's speaking about the radios that we, they, I don't, they use at um, Burning Man to communicate with each other when you're part of, like, staff, or who the fuck gets radios? Uh, because walkie-talkie isn't cool. It's quite possibly the most immature name for really important formative technology. Like, <laughs> such a stride forward in communications networking. So and it sounds like a toy for a two-year-old. So if we generalized it out, we'd call a rifle a pointy shooty? Yeah, yes. Yeah, you know, cars, go eat roomies. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think we could probably flushy. regulate yeah, yeah. guns more easily if we called them pointy, pointy shooties. shooties. Shooty bangies. Yeah. 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go take my shooty bangy to, to shooty bang some skeet. <laughs> So yes, when I'm talking about radios, I'm talking about the walkie-talkies that volunteers use to communicate. Uh, in particular, I used it a lot when I rangered. Every ranger has a radio. Important thing for you to know out there, every ranger has a radio. And every person on a radio needs a very distinct call name. Two syllables at least. And hard consonants, at least one good hard consonant. Hence Rex. Rex on the radio. That's me. Rex. Hi, friends.
I also had a surprise wedding at Burning Man. In fact, my, my story is, is kind of parallel to yours. I had a very, very cheap wedding. We got married on the beach in Oregon, on the Oregon dunes, in the one spot where you can camp without paying. Uh, on the entire Oregon coast, the one free camping spot. And my best man was unable to make it because he's a criminal and a lowlife and had a bad ID. Those are not connected facts. But he felt very bad about not being able to board a plane because of his terrible ID. And as soon as he realized this was going to be the case, he began planning us a secret surprise wedding. He sent emails to the entirety of my department, my volunteer department behind our back, set out this massive plan to redecorate piece of uh, infrastructure into a, a wedding chapel, sent my wife and I off all day on bizarre wild goose chases uh, disguised as important work activities. Uh, when we showed up back in camp in the middle of the day, confused, frustrated, and slightly angry, we found ourselves stuffed into absurd wedding clothes, led into a group of all our friends at Burning Man, read two wildly hilarious wedding vows by two fantastic priests, and then taken on a photographic tour of all of the wedding chapels on the playa so we could have a whole array of wedding photos. So I'm a little confused. Were you married against your will? No, I was, I was remarried with... Uh, without prior with, knowledge. Without prior knowledge. With limited knowledge. notice. Yes, with, with, <laughs> with no notice whatsoever. That's funny. Cream Pie and I also had an incredibly cheap wedding um, at the only place in San Francisco's Park Service where they don't make you pay to rent the place because they couldn't imagine anybody wanting to rent the place to do anything with. <laughs> um, and that's a park called Wormwater Cove, which in San Francisco is colloquially known as Toxic Beach, which is where uh, me and my friends, Beth, when we moved to San Francisco, we went to the raves. Back in the day? Back in the day when the uh, when we had the raves by the bay. Did, did you hold a glow stick in each hand and do a glow stick dance for your friends? Um, I'm not going to say in each hand, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I definitely did dance with lights and they was super cool when I was gold. doing it. Um, so when we, when we went to Burning Man, I didn't want to have a wedding there, mostly because I don't like plans in general and... At Burning Man in specific, I hate being required to be someplace at some time. So uh, so we decided to have a reception instead. <laughs> <laughs> nice. uh, because that's just a party. And uh, anyone who wanted to come out with us could meet us at the man at 6.30. And it was the year of the 100-foot tall man. 2014, there was the 105-foot tall man that was standing on the playa. And underneath his right foot if I'm not mistaken, was the breakers to turn on all of the LEDs and the neon, which we got to do. And then we got our pictures taken in front of the man. And because the man was so tall that year, all of the photos of Cream Pie and I are really oddly foreshortened. <laughs> we look super pear-shaped because, like, <laughs> Violet had to lay down on her back and shoot up at us to get these photos. So, like... It looks like I have the largest ankles imaginable. And at some point during our reception, I'm talking to our friend, and he points out to me that he hasn't done it in 25 years. Here's what I'm going to put out there. Okay. I, I, I am not opposed to people telling drug stories. Yeah. I think it would be really smart if we didn't. It's a really good point. Because we're the only consistent thing. On mm -hmm. so other people, we can... We can obscure their identity. Fair <laughs> enough. The three of us will not tell our hope. personal drug stories, but we allow other people to tell their drug Absolutely. stories. Absolutely. Okay, cool. Um, What's your last name, John? <laughs> <laughs> What's your social? Uh, spanky Bananas. <laughs> so, John Spanky Bananas, do you have any drug stories? Is that hyphenated? Underscore. <laughs> spanky Ban underscore Nez. <laughs> the S is a dollar sign, too. <laughs> I mean, does, does weed even count as drug stories? <laughs> In Nevada, yes, because you can go away for like four years, 15 years. Yeah. Even though Burning Man seems like 
a state unto itself, Burning Man still exists within the state of Nevada. Now, I would like to say that neither Rex nor I are lawyers. So please take what we're saying worth a grain of legal salt. What we do have in front of us is uh, the Nevada Laws and Penalties Sheet from normal.org. That is N-O-R-M-L dot org. They have been working to legalize marijuana across the country for a couple decades now to normalize marijuana use, as it were. Knowingly maintaining a structure used for drug offenses in Nevada is a felony which carries with it a mandatory one to six year penalty and a $10,000 fine. We're talking about knowing maintaining a structure used for drug offenses. That could be your tent, that could be your living container, that could be your camper. Your cute little dome with the hookah in the middle. If that structure is from 100 pounds to a ton, which is 2,000 pounds, um, that would be your tent. But if you have some sort of a living container, or if you have a, a trailer or a camper that you're staying in, chances you are you're in the 2,000 to 10,000 pound range. DJ, I think you're reading this all wrong. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I think these are these are two different things. I think the, the top one is a felony for knowingly maintaining a structure. The next three columns are civil penalties that, are, that can be tacked onto your possession charge based on the weight of your pot. Nobody has 10,000 plus pounds of pot. Well, sure, dealers do. It's the... So it's not the weight of the structure? No. <laughs> like I said before, this is an example of how poorly we understand the laws governing <laughs> marijuana use, sale, delivery, possession, and uh, transit in Nevada. Your takeaway here is that the Accuracy Third podcast cautions against doing illegal things in highly repressive situations. And the fact that you can hear us smoke pot right now doesn't matter because I have a card. Okay. <laughs> you can hear it so incredibly clearly. It's just like in the foreground. Yeah. It's, it's not like we're saying who's doing it. You Someone and, could you be smoking and, you a and I, You and I are doing entirely legal things right now. Uh, yeah. No, I, I'm taking my medicine. Yes. No crime. <laughs> Which sometimes I get off a wheel of fortune. Because <laughs> the pharmacy is insane in California. <laughs> I got I got medicine for my for my birthday. Um, they the, sent me an email and said, "Come in anytime this week. We have medicine." Oh, that's insane. <laughs> um, I, I, I love the idea of going into a CVS or Walgreens and getting like your prescription for erythromycin filled <laughs> and then they have you spin the wheel of fortune and you win like you some win breath some strips and like a Tylenol. <laughs> well, you wanted the Prozac. On, you didn't get that. Come on, Viagra. Come on, Viagra. Come on, Viagra. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. A case of condoms. <laughs> Toilet paper. Like, w wouldn't that be a great commerce experience if every one of them had some sort of game of chance attached to it as a bonus. Safeway these days will let you play a shitty game of Monopoly. Yeah, I saw that. I'm not doing I've, it. I've asked them to stop giving it to me because <laughs> it's just putting trash in my backpack. Um, no, I... So when people decide that they want me to play games with them, <coughs> I play games with them. And I've had this interaction three times at Safeway already where they've said, do you play Monopoly? And I say, yeah, doesn't everyone? <laughs> and they say, no, for the store. And I say, I'm pretty sure you're not on that board. And they're like, no, we're doing a promotion. And I was like, I want a game of Monopoly? <laughs> it's going to be loud, Beth. It's going to be true. Oh. See? <laughs> Yeah, that door is the one you're shutting. See, so there's a thing in front of it, and it's back. <laughs> the Accuracy Third Podcast is recorded in large part in the garage of the House of Nails and Unicorns. As Cream Pie and I are general makers of things, the garage is filled with our making things stuff and acts as our workshop and our repository of gigantic cans of muralizing paint. And I also run a nonprofit, so we're also surrounded by wood and bottles of wine for a gala. And so many children's toys. Yeah. Like a creepy amount of children's toys. But I'm not creepy, and neither is my nonprofit.
Well, the nonprofit's not creepy. So if you notice echoes, the sound of dog toenails on linoleum, trucks or going down the 45 degree hill with their brakes squealing, interesting neighbors being interesting, I refer to them as belligerent. All of the things are artifacts of our, let's say, organic setting. Yeah. Yeah, we need to move your chair out of way. It's not going to stop. <laughs> Hang on, hang on. Yeah, no, Beth just has to get out of the way of the sensor, and she is. Okay, nobody move. Aha. It does look like there's a blood stain on it right there, doesn't All right. it? Oh, there is. Like, just um, look that was, like... That's from our last Beth. That's we have to <laughs> we have to differentiate right. last Beth with drunk Beth. Um, I have a prefixes. question. What's your question? <laughs> Why are we wearing headphones? I can't hear anyone's voice through these headphones. Uh. Oh, that's a problem. <laughs> They're just decorative. No, <laughs> you should be hearing things from oh. it. Um, is it plugged in? That's usually a problem. It's if, plugged in over there. Yeah, no. it, it's going up. I don't know. I mean, I like them. They make me feel really professional. But, uh, <laughs> sure. You're not getting yeah. anything out of that? My ears are warm. Um, let me know when you're recording. We're, oh, we've been recording for a while. Great. Yeah, we, okay. don't, we don't cut. Do I need to introduce myself or you'll introduce me? Um, well, please introduce yourself. Okay. Hi, I'm Cream Pie. Hi, Cream Pie. Hi. Welcome to the basement studio, Cream Pie. Wow. Okay, okay. So, yeah, it was my friend's first year, and uh, they were coming to Burning Man, and they had heard that uh, you're supposed to bring, you know, some kind of interactive thing. Their interactive thing was going to be, uh, like, a playground. And they brought all these, like, swing sets out. They unfortunately camped really close to Kidsville, where all the families camp. They kind of became this uh, unintentional babysitting camp where all of the hippie parents would drop off their kids and then go out and experience Burning Man. And this poor camp full of people that had never been there before ended up having this, like, de facto responsibility over everyone else's children, which... They did not want it at all. And way to go, hippie parents. <laughs> way, to, way to fucking go. That's how you get feral kids. Right? Yeah. Oh, the place was just swarming with kids. These are not professional swings or professional people. The kids were falling off, hurting themselves. They had no idea what to do with these like other people's injured children. And, um, Take them to medical. <laughs> <laughs> it was like not their responsibility. So finally, they go, okay, you know what? We are sick of having to leave someone in camp at all times to watch other people's abandoned children on our swing sets. We are all going to leave, and we're going to write a big sign on there that says, Adult Swings Only. And they put it up there, and they all went out and had a great time at Burning Man, and they came back... <laughs> And there was just people having sex all <laughs> over their swings. <laughs> right next to Kidsville. <laughs> That's beautiful. Look, if you take your kids to Burning Man, they're going to see some people having sex. Not the roving packs of people having sex with kids anymore, though. Not since uh, Nambla got booted. Yeah, that art car hasn't gotten approved in years. <laughs> <laughs> It's a shame, too, because it was a really fine piece of work. <laughs> <laughs> they put a lot of time and energy into that art car. Accuracy Third is engineered primarily by Drunk Bath and ancillarily poorly by D-Day. Our theme music was composed by Jim and Damien. Accuracy Third is produced by Accuracy Third, which is Drunk Bath, D-Day, and Rex. And thank you for visiting Accuracy Third. Accuracy Third. Accuracy Third.